Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I am so happy to see all of you tonight. It's Northern Kentucky History Hour um, brought to you by Behringer Crawford Museum. We're letting everyone in who's joining us via Zoom. My name is Tara Johnson Nome. I'm one of the trustees of Behringer Crawford and we are so happy to have you with us this evening. Uh, look forward to a really interesting conversation tonight. I uh, do just want to do a couple of quick housekeeping items while we're getting started and everyone's joining via Zoom. You'll notice that everyone's microphone is muted, but we do want you to take part. If you're joining us via Zoom, you can add questions and comments in the chat. If you are joining us live on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comment in the comment section, and uh, I'll be watching both of those and um, compiling all of the questions and comments for our guests tonight, and then uh, be able to make sure that they get answered at the end of the presentation. Um, I believe we haven't talked about it, Mr. Arnold, but I believe we're having a quiz tonight, uh, and if that is the case. Um, get your fingers ready for typing and the first person with the correct answer, um, again, either on Facebook or on Zoom, will win our prize, uh, bragging rights, and a little pin uh, from Northern Kentucky History Hour and Barrier Crawford Museum. So um, I do want to say a couple quick thank yous uh, to the supporters of the museum. Barrier Crawford Museum is uh, supported financially by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, and the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation. We are so grateful to all of those organizations for their support, and we are also so grateful to our members. Uh, many of you on the Zoom here tonight I know are already members of the museum, and we are very grateful for that. Um, but if you are not a member already, you can go to bcmuseum.org and um, sign up. And you can, uh, we would certainly appreciate your support in these trying times. Uh, we have a goal to get to 50 new members uh, as a result of the Northern Kentucky History Hour by May. And we have about 20 to go. So uh, we really appreciate you helping us uh, reach that goal. Um, I will say that if you have uh, joined us and you have your video on, especially if you're moving around a lot, it would really help us if you could, uh, you'll still be able to see everything, but if you could turn your video off, that would really help a whole lot with um, allowing everyone to focus uh, on the presentation. So we would appreciate that. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, I also want to thank the museum staff and the, uh, my fellow trustees for all the support in making uh, this program happen. So let me get to introducing our guest. Mr. Arnold Taylor is a graduate of University of Kentucky and University of Kentucky College of Law. He retired from his Northern Kentucky legal practice in January of 2018. He is a uh, member, he's a director of the Kenton County Historical Society and past, present, uh, past president. He is also a current director of the Covington Rotary Club. He is author of Rose, A Woman of Color, A Slave Struggle for Freedom in the Courts of Kentucky, Suing for Freedom in Kentucky, Named Slaves in Kenton County Court Records, Fit to Drink, The History of Water Supply in Covington, Kentucky, and 100 Years of Service Above Self, The History of the Rotary Club of Covington, Kentucky. He resides in Edgewood, and I am so happy to have him with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Arnold, um, it is um, all yours. Go ahead and, uh, and get started. You can share your screen and say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, Tara, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sound okay. great. All right. I apologize for the uh, little delay. Uh, my setup was uh, not quite adapted to what we needed to do tonight. So, um, I'm also not going to be able to see some of my notes, so some of the things I may forget, um, it may be a little bumpy, but we'll go ahead and get started and um, go from there. 
So the first thing on your screen is a, a symbol that you've probably seen in your doctor's office uh, uh, on the uh, Sharps container. Uh, it's the symbol for a biohazard. And um, so uh, uh, if, uh, if some, some of my friends sometimes say that it's uh, hazardous to their health to listen to me, uh, but this is to give you a warning of what you're about to see. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't think we have you shared quite yet. Go ahead and um, try to share your screen once more. You don't see King Collar in Covington now? Not yet. I think you have to hit that share screen button again. Oh boy. It's okay. I'm not. If, let's see, if you're in Zoom and at the bottom of your screen, that, that green button, it should work just like it did. I can no longer see any of those buttons. Okay, so if you go to the bottom of your screen where you can see the different um, programs. No, I can't, you, I can't see that at all. If you move your cursor around, maybe you can see diff, like wherever you would normally go to see different programs you should be able to click somewhere to see Zoom. Okay. All right, let's try this again. Okay. Well, I tell you what, here's one way we could do it. Uh, you can see, you can see the uh, symbol now, but you can also see my, uh, no. can, can you no. also see my, my slides off to the left? No, no, sorry, we can't, we can't see your presentation, so, that's why I said, I think you need to click on share again. Okay. Um, somebody said you might be in full screen of uh, you in Zoom, uh, which is why you're just seeing all the uh, people. So okay. if if, um, if you move the cursor to the bottom of your page, yep. it might allow you to see um, the uh, Zoom app to be able to find share screen at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I can I can find that now. Okay. Click that again. Yes, please. Great. There you go. And if you want to click uh, look at uh, slideshow and view from beginning, then we'll just see just the slides. Yep, that first icon from beginning. Okay. Now we're all set. All right, sorry folks. I cannot, I cannot move the slides at all. If you are on your laptop, if you hit the arrow forward um, or maybe the space bar or the return bar, it should make it move forward. No. Did that okay. do anything? Yep, that's it. Okay. All right. The presentation, as you can see, or good, you could see, is uh, about King Cholera in Covington, Kentucky, 1832 to 1873. And the first question you might ask is why is it called King Cholera? And the reason is that cholera, unlike many diseases, moved so quickly that um, there was almost uh, no escape from it once it started on your body. You could be perfectly well in the morning and then be dead by nightfall. One woman was hired to wash the clothes of a cholera victim, and 10 hours later, she was dead. It moves that quickly. I gave a version of this presentation to, to the Kenton County Historical Society uh, about two or three years ago, and I never imagined that uh, at this point in time, I'd be talking in the presence uh, in, the, in the ongoing pandemic of COVID-19, uh, but as we go through this presentation, you'll see that there are a lot of similarities uh, in these two pandemics that we're gonna be talking about of cholera and COVID-19. Both of them uh, 
inflicted economic and personal hardships on uh, people. Um, the difference is we know that COVID is a virus. They in the 19th century did not know anything until the late 19th century about the germ theory of bacteria. So they didn't know what the cause was. We know ways to minimize the risk of being infected. We may choose not to use some of them, but we know that there are ways. Uh, in the 19th century, it was guesswork, all sorts of strange ideas about how century the disease was caused. We may choose. What was that? I thought somebody said something, sorry. Um, and we know that a vaccine is here, uh, but they knew none of this. So until the late 19th century, cholera was uh, to most people a terror and a mystery. There were seven cholera, cholera pandemics uh, up to 1873, and that included three of the pandemics, the second, third, and fourth, in the ones that afflicted Cincinnati and Covington in 1835, 1832 to 1835, 1849 to 1853, and then the one in 1873. In all of these, there was consistent panic and denial. So this presentation, what I want to do first is talk about the facts about cholera, uh, then talk about the uh, 19th century's ideas about the cause of, of the disease, uh, uh, attempt to prevent it and supposed cures, then we'll talk about the three epidemics in Covington touching on Cincinnati at the same time. And during this presentation, you have in your own mind, I think some interesting parallels uh, to COVID-19. Now in the 19th century, the term cholera was attached to three different conditions. There was cholera morbus, there was cholera infantum. Cholera morbus and cholera infantum were applied to a non-specific diarrhea. The term cholera morbus was applied to adults and older children. Cholera infantum, as the name implies, applied to infants and small children. But neither of these is the true cholera. The true cholera is Asiatic cholera, which is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae. Now, why is it called Asiatic? That's because it started in Asia, went into Russia, then into Europe, and then in the later epidemics on to other countries such as uh, the United States. This guy, Robert Koch, uh, identified the bacterium in 1883. And he, for a long time, has had the credit for uh, discovery of the bacterium. Actually, though, this was the second discovery of the bacterium. This man, Filippo Pacini, a physician in Florence, Italy, wrote a paper in 1854 in which he identified the bacterial cause of cholera and his work went unnoticed or rejected. Uh, he identified uh, the uh, process of uh, the disease, what was happening to the human body in the course of cholera. Uh, but because his work was unnoticed for a long time, this was an opportunity that was missed to save many lives in the future. His work was finally recognized in 1884, a year after he died. And I told you that the, that the, the bacterium is called Vibrio cholerae. Well, I lied a little bit because since 1865, when the International Committee on Nomenclature uh, changed the name, it is technically Vibrio cholerae Pacini, 1854. Now, one thing about both Coke and Pacini is the medical profession at the time uh, did not accept their conclusions uh, as to the relationship of uh, cholera uh, and the uh, particular germ. But anyway, um, this is a picture of Vibrio cholerae. Uh, Pacini correctly identified it in its typical comma shape. 
uh, it, its motility is provided by a flagellum. And this is probably the closest you ever want to be to this particular uh, germ. The, mechan the mechanism of the disease is that um, uh, when, the, when the cholera bacterium enters the, the human body, um, enzymes in the body uh, allow the uh, bacterium to just explode in a number. And the bacterium puts off this uh, toxin, which attaches to the intestines. And from there on, it's a rapid loss of bodily fluids. The person that's afflicted with the disease becomes dehydrated. They go into shock. And then most of the time, they die. It's not 100% fatal, but by and large, it is. Now, this is a description from a newspaper about the final death process of someone afflicted with the disease. So I'm, I don't want to gross you out, but I'm just going to let you read this for yourselves. So it was just a terrible way to die. Now, very early on, doctors and others that were interested in this disease had a dim perception that water somehow played a role in its spread. Some of you may have heard of this guy. This is Dr. John Snow, who's considered the father of epidemiology. In 1854, uh, he traced an outbreak of, uh, outbreak of cholera in uh, the Soho district of London to the Broad Street pump uh, from which uh, local residents were getting their water. And he uh, persuaded the local council to remove the handle from the pump. But even he did not identify the true cause of the, of the, the outbreak, the cholera outbreak. Um, he uh, saw these white flo flocculent particles in water under a microscope. And, what, and flocculent means uh, fuzzy looking like uh, wool. And what he was seeing was colonies of the um, of the uh, bacterium. Now, the epidemic stopped almost immediately, but the medical community rejected his theory that there was some sort of uh, uh, substance in the water that was causing uh, the disease, even though the epidemic stopped when the water handle was removed. And he was opposed by a water company. Uh, so um, he uh, just was not recognized as a finder of the disease at that time. And uh, this is a cartoon from London about that time. Uh, the, the newspapers would be very critical of boards of health and doctors who don't, didn't seem to be able to find uh, uh, what the cause was. And this is, a, it's too hard for you to read, but these two guys are saying to each other, uh, we must find something. It won't do to lose 20 guineas a day. So the uh, public, by and large, looked upon the boards of health as just uh, making money and the doctors at just making money off the disease. Now, this fellow is, John Lay, is a guy who was in Cincinnati. And in 1849, he developed a geologic theory about salts and minerals in some water. Uh, he noticed that the residents of Sycamore Hill in Cincinnati were hit hard by cholera, but because Sycamore Hill was too far up from the lower parts of Cincinnati for miasma to be the cause, you, you, some of you may remember that uh, malaria was uh, supposed bad air and, and other diseases uh, had attributed to them this miasma that somehow floated from uh, uh, unclean places. Uh, bodies of water and so forth. But since the, the Sycamore Hill was too high up for that to be the cause, he decided that he would uh, investigate uh, the sources of water that were being used by these Sycamore Hill residents. Some of them used rainwater and others used spring water. So he developed a map of the afflicted and unafflicted people in Sycamore, on Sycamore Hill. 
He differentiated the buildings by the type of water used, whether it was spring or rainwater. And then he identified the buildings uh, by which, uh, uh, in which uh, someone did or did not die of cholera. And he developed this map, uh, which you can't really see very well. So I've blown up a small portion of it. And what he did was draw a little building and he would put an S underneath that or uh, an R if, it was, uh, if the household had used rainwater. And then he would indicate the number or the, or the fact that people had died. And it pretty well established a relationship between uh, spring water, the well water, and the people that died. Now, there was, there was a little bit of an outlier sometime. And the one I like the most is, is this one, where in the, the drinking house, even though they were using spring water, there were no deaths. And so I always think that they were either just drinking beer or they, uh, they were diluting their, uh, their water with some alcohol. So in any event, he was wrong, of course. But another Cincinnatian came up with an idea years even before lay or snow. In 1832, he suggested that drinking water should first be boiled. Well, we now, of course, know that that could be a very effective solution to the, uh, the contamination of the water. His name was Henry Boyd. He was a famous Cincinnati furniture maker. Uh, he, uh, he developed what was known as the Boyd bed. And the Cincinnati Gazette in October of 1832 said that he had suggested that boiling drinking water would uh, prevent um, cholera. Of course, he was ignored too. Uh, and this was another opportunity missed. Now, who was this guy? Uh, he, well, if you missed your, your uh, Black History Month uh, lesson, here's one for you. He was a Kentucky slave that, uh, uh, whose owner had let him work on jobs and save money to buy his own freedom. And so that's what he did ultimately. And so uh, I can't help but think that one of the reasons he was ignored or his advice was ignored was because of, uh, of his race and any prejudices that would come along with that. Now let's talk about the 19th century theories of cause, prevention, and cure. Suppose causes. It was something airborne and contagious. Or it wasn't. The doctors just couldn't make up their minds. Uh, it was from filthy water and unsanitary conditions. And so when that was attributed to the, uh, the cause attributed to that, there'd be frenzies of cleaning streets and, and alleys. Uh, the old favorite, deleterious cause in the atmosphere, the miasma theory. Uh, this is the one that even, even, uh, uh, even Koch and uh, Pacini uh, were opposed by their other physician colleagues because the medical profession was certain that it was a, a cause a caused by miasma. Or eating green vegetables, or eating watermelon. Watermelon was described as a cholera bomb. Petting your dog. Uh, well, let's see. Um, well, I can't go back, but anyway. Um, here are some of the theories that were uh, espoused by the medical profession as to uh, how it could be prevented. Avoid intoxication in the night air. Eat only these meats. Uh, I don't know what pork had to do with anything, but uh, uh, pork is not apparently in this list. Wear woolen clothes. Now, the, these advices were being given by, among other people, the, the famous Daniel Drake, Dr. Daniel Drake over in Cincinnati in 1832 when he was treating cholera patients. So he's giving this kind of advice. And at the same time, they've got uh, the fellow, the carpenter who's saying, boil your water, boil your drinking water. But the one I think is the best is if you maintain a cheerful demeanor, you won't get cholera. The supposed cures 
opium, well, that might make you feel better for a while, I suppose. Calomel, which is mercury chloride. Well, mention mercury and you've got to start thinking about toxicity right off. Same with sugar, lead, lead acetate. The 19th century doctors seem to like their heavy metals. Bloodletting. I mean, you've got a debilitated patient already and you start letting blood, uh, that can't help. Then of course, there's always the patent nostrums, the cure-alls for everything. Here is an example of a cure for Asiatic cholera or prevention uh, that was being pushed by some uh, folks in Covington. They had their office at 6th and Madison. And uh, so they explained how these uh, particular pills of theirs could help. There's nothing stated about what's in them, but based upon what I've read, it would probably contain at least either the, um, the lead acetate or uh, the calomel, the mercury chloride. But above all, the most contraindicated cure was purging. In other words, a person is losing all his bodily fluids anyway, and then some doctors saying we ought to purge him more. This was, this was based on the homeopathic theory that if you mimic the disease, uh, you could cure it. Well, uh, obviously, we know that that is not the case. The true cure. Antibiotics, well, if, if I, I guess if you got a bolus of some antibiotics early on when you came down with cholera that it could help. But remember, uh, cholera moves so fast that an antibiotic might ha not have an opportunity to really do much good. Um, there are vaccines, um, but a vaccine won't cure uh, the condition. So it has to be taken before you're infected. And the prize question is when was the first cholera vaccine invented? Uh, and I'm gonna give you a little helpful hint. Wikipedia is wrong about that. So uh, that's the prize question. When was the first cholera vaccine invented? The true cure is aggressive rehydration. Uh, this is what Pacini in his, his uh, uh, 1849, uh, 1854 uh, paper, I keep hitting my button. Uh, this is what he recommended. And so the cure even today is aggressive rehydration through oral or intravenous uh, administration of uh, fluids and uh, glucose and electrolytes. Now, we can't say that it can't happen here uh, because an example of where it can happen is in Haiti. Haiti is uh, our hemisphere's poorest country. And before the October 2014, or the, the, the earthquake that happened just before that, cholera was completely unknown in Haiti. But when uh, aid arrived from other countries, there were some Nepalese soldiers who came, and cholera is endemic to uh, Nepal. Uh, they had some bad sanitary practices uh, and as a result polluted some water sources and uh, for the first time ever, Haiti had cholera. And then remember that there have been three more pandemics since 1873. And for example, there was a cholera outbreak in New York in 1883. So while it may not be likely, it can happen here. All right, let's talk about uh, the 1832-1835 epidemic. The first indications of cholera coming to the United States or to Canada, they, they're not sure which, uh, was in early 1832. Cincinnati had a case by September 30th of 1832. Covington had its first case in October, on October 4, 1832. Now, as to all the, the reports of numbers that I'm gonna give you uh, with a, a couple of exceptions, these are reports from newspapers. So we're going, 
with pretty limited information through most of, of these, uh, uh, these epidemics. So that's the sources, though, that I'm using for this information. The 1832 epidemic caused 571 people in Cincinnati to die. That was about 4 to 5% of its population. We have little detailed information about the uh, incidents in Covington in 1832, but we do have some information. Uh, we, we don't know the names and numbers. There was no health department. There were no death records. Um, but if we project a 5% mortality rate in 1832, when we had about 800 people, uh, there would, should have been about 40 deaths. But we have no way to, to actually confirm the number. But we know that it was severe. How do we know that? This, um, this is a, a piece from a, a contemporary who wrote about the 1832 epidemic. Deserted streets, uh, fears for those around us, gloomy anticipation, the Asiatic cholera was here. The, uh, the area, uh, Northern Kentucky, uh, had planned a 50-year reunion of the troops that assembled at the point in 1782. Uh, and, and that was going to be in 1832, the 50-year reunion. Simon Kenton was supposed to come. He was an elderly man, and he was told to stay away. So we know that it was bad in 1832. Uh, we just don't know exactly how bad. Uh, the, the Covington trustees tried to assist the sick poor. Uh, they raised some money, and uh, uh, they did what they could. But again, and they really didn't know what the cause was or what the real treatment was. Um, you should know what the water sources were for people in Covington in 1832, uh, because it demonstrates uh, how limited they were and how easily a contamination could spread. There were the rivers, of course. There was a well on Greenup between 2nd and 3rd Streets, and there was a spring on the bank of the Ohio at the foot of Greenup, and, and that was it. There may have been some private wells, but those were the public resources for water. We know that uh, people who could afford to do so left town. This is very common uh, whenever there's an epidemic like this. Those that can do it, get out of town. We know that there was impact on the business from the contemporary writers. Newspapers didn't like to print news about cholera. It was bad for business. And doctors often minimize the severity uh, or the extent of an epidemic. Uh, there would be a conspiracy of silence. And I even read about a conspiracy to silence. There was a doctor in an Indiana River town who kept saying to people that cholera was in town, but they didn't want to hear it. And ultimately, he was driven away from, from his practice because of public sentiment, what they didn't want to hear. We know a little more about the 1849 to 1853 epidemic. We know that it came into New York or was identified on December 1, 1848. We know that it arrived in New Orleans or it was identified in December, on December 11th of 1848. And this was probably because of the uh, soldiers returning from the Mexican War, um, bringing it with them. Cincinnati's first case was December 25. And you remember New, uh, New Orleans was December 11th. So it was, it was coming up river. Uh, the newspapers were in denial. The Cincinnati Enquirer in April wrote, rumors of cholera are fostered by speculators. Now what they were talking about is uh, somebody might supposedly have a store of uh, of goods, grain or meats or, or uh, other foodstuffs. And if you said there's cholera in Covington that in, in, uh, in town, that might drive away the uh, uh, farmers who would normally be bringing food and meats and so forth into the city. So this is another example of um, the newspapers saying, there's nothing going on, don't worry about it, keep on going. Uh, well, that rumor killed almost 6,000 Cincinnatians in 1849 to 1851. That's over 5% of the population. 
of Cincinnati at that time. By May 7th, three people had died in Covington. And the Covington Journal on May 23rd said, there's no reason to be alarmed. Uh, prudent and discreet is a sort of a code word, I think, code words, I think, for if, you, if you're well off and, and uh, uh, you take better care of yourself, you need not worry, which is not true, of course. We can't precisely ascertain the morbidity and mortality rates in Covington. There was no health department. There was no publication of statistics. Uh, papers kept saying little alarm, little alarm about cholera. And on May 24th, one doctor wrote that the disease had nearly disappeared. But people who were not as intent on concealing the actual truth said that it was really very severe with many fatalities in the summer of 1849. But by June, even the Covington Journal was admitting that conditions hadn't improved and they were asking for creation of a, of a health board and some publication of official statistics. As I said, we're getting our information from newspaper reports. Um, five died in April or May, April, May, 11 in June, 19 in July. But that's only 35 or so people. And none of this is entirely accurate. And it's often contradictory because the same doctor who wrote in April of 49 that the uh, extent of the epidemic was exaggerated later stated that there had been 150 cases. So everything that we know uh, about this particular epidemic is, is just incomplete. We had about 9,400 people in, in Covington in 1850. And if we had 150 deaths, that was 1.5% of the residents. Now, keeping in mind our limited data uh, and uh, remembering that uh, there were no uh, house numbers on uh, buildings uh, in this particular, particular time period, 1849, 1850. What do we know about the pattern of the disease in this time period of April to July? Well, first off, you, you can't really see it, or I can't really see it, but uh, there is indication of a well, just so you'll know the water sources. There was a well, public well at, at uh, Robbins and Greenup. Uh, there was a public well on 9th Street, west of Covington, uh, Madison. Uh, there was the public well uh, at 3rd and Greenup, and there was a public well at the foot of Scott Street. Now, there were, there were private wells, of course. I can't tell you how many. Uh, there were also cisterns, but the cisterns were always being complained about. Um, they would get mud in them. And if they could collect mud, then who knows what else they might collect. So what I've done is identify as best I can, remember no street addresses. Uh, this is where Bogenschutz's foundry was. This is where the, uh, uh, the slaughterhouse was. But I've indicated in these green, with these green pins where the cholera started. And as time went on, And you'll see it's always in clusters, at least two. I'll just uh, illustrate for you. Um, I don't have my notes, but uh, uh, Mr. Hewitt uh, died uh, in um, late June, and his wife died a little after he did, leaving five orphans. So that's just a description of the, the magnitude of, of, of harm that this epidemic inflicted on families. Mr. Hill um, lost his wife, his, his daughter, and his son. 
lost his entire family to cholera. These are just some examples to give you a, a little personal feel for this as opposed to just green dots. All right, now I've gone back and put W's by the sites of these wells because you can look at the location of the, of the water source and maybe be able to see uh, why some people may have uh, uh, been affected by cholera. I'm particularly interested in this cluster right here uh, because you, you see I put a C here. Well. I told you that there were cisterns. Well, this particular cistern was at 6th and Washington, um, where the then German Catholic Church was. And the fire department would complain about that particular cistern because it always was full of mud and would clog up their hoses. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to the view that this, uh, this cistern was the source of this particular cluster. I don't have any proof of that but that's just the, the theory that I have. Um, there were three or two more reported deaths in Covington in June of 1850, 20 at deaths in 1852, although um, apparently 13 or 14 railroad workers and their family members also died. So it was still around. A death in June of 1853, eight deaths in July of 1854. Now, then the epidemic of 1873 occurred, and we know somewhat more about that. Uh, it came into, the disease came into New Orleans in February of 1873. It was up the river into St. Louis in May of 1873. And on May 21, the Enquirer was saying that cholera had had its day. Well, they, they must have read the shipping news in the meantime, because they then said on May 24th, that Covington should prepare for cholera. Uh, June 5, the Enquirer asked whether they were ready for the grim visitor. Cincinnati's first case was reported in June of 1873. Our first reported death was June 22nd. We still had no health department to speak of. And uh, this, this uh, critical piece in the newspaper says that that wonderful body met, passed one resolution, adjourned, let us be done with the pretense. This was a, another example, this is again a, a London cartoon, not an American cartoon, but again, the public felt that boards of health were just not doing what they were supposed to do, whatever that was. And this satirical piece came in in one of the newspapers saying that the board, Covington Board of Health met and uh, decided that it was inexpedient to have cholera and that the physicians want, would, should do all they could to play, stay the plague where there's a prospect of proper compensation and that each individual should be requested not to take the cholera. Again, this constant, this concept that doctors we're just making money off the cholera pie, as that says right there. Now, this was a national epidemic. And so we've got the, the uh, somewhat of a benefit in that a Surgeon General's report was uh, published. But it's not really accurate. Uh, it relied on information obtained from Covington physicians. And the inaccuracy of that is, is shown by the inconsistency between the report and the news articles. Newspaper said 30 deaths. The report said 25 deaths. The Surgeon General said seven people died in West Covington. The newspaper said 17 people died in West Covington. So um, again, fairly limited resources, but 
looking again at the pattern of incidents in 1873 for this uh, uh, a little more than a month of June to July. Again, we have the start right here. And there's a case up there. This is down in, I guess that would be Ludlow. Okay, this is all I can identify from the newspaper's uh, specific references, but let's let's look at this a moment. No cases up here. Here's some cases. Here's some cases. Here's some cases. Here's some cases. And way down there, there's some cases. Why is this collection of cases up here? Well. Uh, if you bought my book, The History of Covington Water Supply, you'd know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> here's, here's what I think is the reason. This indicates, this red line indicates, the water system that Covington had managed to put in place by 1871. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to go back to that. Anyway, anyway you saw it. Um, so, the, the red line delineates the area where the water system served. Not, not every house had signed up yet to have a, a hydrant in front of their house. It wasn't popped into the, pumped into their house. There was a hydrant in front of your house. Um, but most people had signed or were signing up. And having the central water system uh, prevented the, the various ways that uh, the contamination occurred. And, one thing, I, because of my notes I, I missed, uh, it, it wasn't always caused by water. I mean, people, families would take care of their sick people and there could be contamination that way or, or the, pump, uh, the pump handle or the water bucket or whatever could be contaminated by an unsanitary hand. But, um, and, there, and there were private, uh, private wells in Covington, but that, uh, that water system did not serve West Covington. And that area where I had Y, uh, that was West Covington. So the reason is that Covington had the fairly extensive benefit of a sanitary water system. It wasn't great water. If you read my book, there's taking it from the Ohio River, but it wasn't contaminated with cholera. Um, July 24th news article said that there were many cases on 12th Street from Greenup to the Licking River. And you may have noticed that I didn't have any on 12th Street. I couldn't find uh, any specifics uh, of, of names or addresses. So that's why I didn't put any there. Was this the end of cholera in Covington? Uh, not quite. Uh, you remember that New York had some in 1883 and so did West Covington. Uh, in 1892, the Post published a cholera edition. Uh, they acknowledged Koch's discovery uh, and the means of transmission. Of course, they didn't know about, uh, or I guess they didn't know about uh, Pacini. And the paper said, read the Post daily to prevent the ennui of existence from making life a burden. But again, the Covington police, uh, Covington health officer said cleanliness uh, and a cheerful demeanor were still part of prevention, and you need not fear even if people were dying all around you. That's my favorite one, be happy, don't worry. And that's the end of my presentation. I, I apologize for the bumpy start. Uh, I'm sure I missed some things I meant to say uh, because of uh, me not being able to see my notes, but uh, that's it. So. Well. I think we all thought it was really interesting and there's actually a lot of questions. Um, if you don't mind sticking with us for just a bit, um, there's Fine. quite a few questions. And so um, I think I'll just dive right in if that's all right. Oh, but let's first give an answer to our quiz. So who developed 
and when the, the cholera vaccine? Just, just when. Just when. Okay. Can you tell us who also? Uh, I've forgotten his name. I have okay. a note. I, I think <laughs> he's a, he was a Spanish uh, physician who studied under um, uh, Pasteur. And he, he invented the first one in 1885. Okay, well then, okay, let me see here. We've got a couple people who answered, I think it was his name, Jaime Ferran. Does that sound right. right? Exactly. Okay, oh my goodness. Well, we have a couple people who got that right. Uh, Tamara Womble got it. And um, let me see here, Carl. Um, Carl, I'm sorry, I still don't know how to pronounce your last name. Well, I'm going to go with Coucher. Um, and a couple of others, um, a little bit, let's see, a little bit later on. So the first, let me see, just make sure. It looks like the first correct one uh, was Tamara, followed close behind less than a minute later. Um, we did just ask when, not who, though the extra info was helpful, everybody. Um, so I'm going to go with... Um, I'm going to go with our winner being a tie between Tamara and actually Norma and Carl. So congratulations to you all. And um, we will do our best to get your uh, pin in the mail to you as soon as we can. So I'm just going to make a quick note. Tamara, Carl, and Norma. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing the quiz. Um, Arnold, we appreciate that. And okay, so the first question is from Marianne, and she would like to know, are you able to share what is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? Sure. Pandemic is worldwide. Epidemic is restricted to an area. Uh, endemic is uh, restricted to a very particular area. So we are presently in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you could say it's, uh, it's sort of an epidemic in the United States, but since it's all through the United States, you could call it a pandemic too, but it's a matter of degree. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, hey, would you mind unsharing your screen so we can see your face? So you just go, yep, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, next question. Um, I, and this is actually my question. So you talked about the different water sources and I'm just curious if someone had been using a wet, a well, how were they moving their water from that, from that well or from, um, the cistern, how are they moving that to their home? Buckets. Just bucket, just truly like just moving it with buckets. Okay. Yeah. Before there were no water lines before 1871. Right, so they're just literally just filling up. Wow, um, I can't, okay, so then the next question is, if we would like to read your book, how can we get a copy of that? Uh, which one? Uh, the, the one about the water supply. Oh. In this case, or any of them actually. Uh, I tell you what, l let me give you my telephone number and okay. people, people, if they want to, they can call me and uh, we can go from there. Okay. Uh, Hold on, right. hold on one second. I'm going to write it in the chat for everybody, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. 859-331-7974. Uh, okay. Great. Perfect. Okay, it's in the chat if anyone would like to contact Mr. Taylor about his book. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, someone asked... Is it true that people were, during the really like height of some of the epidemics, that people were required to really stay in their homes and not be able to leave? Um, it was actually on the Cincinnati side that they, they were told that. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I'm not saying it's not true. I just don't know. I, I never thought about that. Um, I, it, it could be. Um, I, I was talking with a friend uh, recently, and he had been reading um, about the uh, the 1918 flu epidemic, where uh, people were protesting uh, the use of masks. So, 
<laughs> so <laughs> I guess anything, anything like that where people were told to stay home, they would protest it, I suppose. <laughs> Gotcha. I just I don't know though I ha, I not I have not read that. Okay, and then um, another question from um, Marsha is she was wondering for the um, eighteen um, fifty three pandemic specifically she mentioned or I'm sorry epidemic um, were there mass graves uh, you know how how were people handling the number of individuals who were dying um and if so where would those have been located i don't i don't recall ever reading anything about mass graves uh in in, in covington and of of course uh, at that time um the cemetery was uh, linden what's now linden grove right Right. And as an, I, I, I just thought of something I, I, I said in my notes too, but uh, not being able to be sure about a lot of these things. Um, the 1849 epidemic was the one that killed um, um, Dubinek's real father. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't recall reading in the newspaper uh, any reference to, to his name. And I wanted to, and, and of course my German's not good enough if I could get into the records for uh, the German Catholic Church um I, I couldn't have read the records anyway and i was hoping to maybe get into uh, a trinity episcopals uh, records before this presentation but with the library being somewhat restricted um i was unable to see if they had death records too so uh all my all my information that i've offered has been from the newspapers from the newspaper yeah um norma just made um a note that they had heard um just one more quick thing about the families and they were told on a tour that uh, families in Cincinnati were forced to stay in their home and their windows and doors were boarded up from the outside so they could not get out which leads me to another question that we have received um, from Norma that it seems like there were a lot more cases on the Cincinnati side than in the northern Kentucky side even though there were a lot in Covington and do you have any thoughts? Was it was it just a density issue? There were just so many more people in Cincinnati, or or was there something else going on that was that caused that? Well, I think by the uh, the second uh, uh, epidemic, the the size of Cincinnati was such that you had a lot of uh, areas that were not as well off as others. Mm -hmm. You had the industries uh, down down. Uh, downtown uh you had the the slaughterhouses and so forth um that sort of thing and and essentially just as you say there was a concentration of uh, people but because um uh, not everybody in cincinnati at that time was wealthy they were crammed together quite a bit in living quarters uh so uh, that's what makes the transmission so easy is uh you know close contact with people right right no absolutely um, just a couple more questions from the audience. I really, I will say this is one of the most um, set of questions that we've gotten. I think everyone's just really fascinated by this topic. And of course, as you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, it's something that we can a little bit relate to, right? Even though it's different, um, you know, people can imagine some of these things. Um, there's also a couple of interesting comments. Paul mentions that um, in, if you read Latin, Mother of God's records are in Latin. <laughs> so if you <laughs> wanted to try to read those. Um, and uh, Debbie uh, Blake mentions that Spring Grove Cemetery has many graves um, that are marked as cholera you know, victims. Um, one of the questions from Mary, uh, she says, as I remember, some of the orphanages in Cincinnati were founded in the 1830s as a response to the cholera epidemic. Do you happen to know if any of those in Northern Kentucky, like the Diocesan Children's Home, for example, or any others, do we know if they were founded for the same reason? And I, I don't know the history of, of when that was founded. Not sure if you do. Uh, no, I really don't. Yeah. Um, let's see, and I think um, there's all kinds of, oh my gosh, there's so many notes in the comments now. Um, let's see, 
St. Joe's Cemetery in Cincinnati was started because the cholera deaths actually filled up old St. Joe's, according to Blanche. Um, the great thing about our audience is so many people are history buffs themselves, right? And so they're able to contribute to the conversation as well. Um, I know there was one more question in here. Oh, yes, on Facebook, uh, we have Gina Moore with us. Thanks, Gina, for joining uh, via Facebook Live. And she was wondering, do you have any thoughts about what made authorities finally pay attention to Henry Boyd's suggestion to boil water? Um, and was it Henry Boyd or was it just they finally realized to start boiling water for some other reason? Well, uh, uh, one thing, I, again, I had in my notes, I meant to say, I have no idea uh, why Boyd came up with the idea of boiling water. What prompted to say that? Um, but I don't think it was really adopted by anybody for for uh, uh, any period of time, well until well into the uh, later part of the 19th century, because the the germ theory wasn't accepted by physicians until late 19th century. As I as I was saying, yeah. uh, Coke uh, Coke was was criticized. Pacini was criticized by the the medical profession um, because it couldn't be true. It's miasma. Everybody knows it's miasma. Wow. I know I was reading um, a book recently about um, James Madison. And, and I mean, that term is used like throughout, right, throughout the book and, and talking about um, a different epidemic, but um, still very, very hard to imagine these days now that we do have that information, um, how, how challenging it must have been for them, right? Because that they they really just did not know and they wouldn't accept maybe people who, who did have that idea. It's, it's really unfortunate. Um, I, you know, I was, I, I was, uh, I was thinking about the, the listeners comment about uh, people being boarded up in their houses from outside. Um, I can, I can see that happening because if you were afraid that uh, it was, it was going to leak out of the household into other people's, houses that you would uh, try to prevent people from having contact, but yeah. I'd never heard that before. I was, that's interesting. Well, we really appreciate your time. Um, we were a little bit over, so we appreciate everyone who stuck with us. Um, this is such a fun thing for all of us every week. And um, Mr. Ar uh, Mr. Taylor, we are just so happy that you joined us um, and hope that um, I saw a lot of individuals who, uh, who I'm pretty sure are from uh, both Rotary and Kenton County Historical Society. So you have a big fan club tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're really glad to have you um, and something that I, I know that I did not know a lot about. So this has been really informative and we really appreciate it. Um, we do hope that you and everyone on the um, chat here tonight will join us next week. And we'll, we're going to have Bob Schrage and John Schaff with us, and they are going to talk um, more specifically about uh, Governor William Goebel and uh, his assassination and some other things more in depth about him. We've actually had them on before, uh, and they were talking about political scandals, if any of our uh, sort of long term get, uh, audience members uh, remember that, and they're going to go more in depth about Goebel and uh, some of his life and the circumstances around and following his death. So, um, and so join us next week for that. So until then, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Sorry for the delay. Oh no, you're good. Thank you so much. Take care everybody.